to do this morning is uh, we've watched the Bible Project. We watched that last week looking at Ezra and Nehemiah. They put together a short one regarding Haggai. So we're going to look at their short video about the timeline of Haggai. And then I'll go back and highlight this. We're, we haven't looked at one chapter today, right? I mean, it's, uh, you think uh, it's just one chapter. So there's a lot of stuff in there that I know that you went, we went over through our homework. But it's really not a lot of um, difficult things, really. Uh, so let's watch this uh, timeline from the Bible Project people. Uh, I should probably figure out what their names are. I just call them the Bible Project people. Um, but that'll help a little bit, uh, kind of give us a summary of the book of Haggai. Do we need to turn the lights off? Do you see the screen pretty well? The book of the prophet Haggai. It's one of the smaller prophetic books, but crucially important in the overall story of the Hebrew Bible. So for centuries, the Hebrew prophets have been accusing Israel of breaking their covenant with God through idolatry and injustice, and they warned that God would send the great empire of Babylon to take out Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and haul off the people into exile. And it all happened in the year 587 B.C. But that wasn't the end of the story. The prophets also believed that there was still hope, and that God would one day bring back a transformed remnant of his people Israel to live in a new Jerusalem, where God's presence would live in their midst. Now when we turn to Haggai, the year is 520 BC, nearly 70 years after the exile. And the Babylonian Empire has recently collapsed, and the world is now ruled by the Persians. Now they allowed the return of any exiled Israelites who wanted to go back to Jerusalem, which still lay in ruins. And so under the leadership of a high priest named Joshua, and Zerubbabel, an heir from the line of David, and a group of exiles, they all returned and began to rebuild the city and their lives. Remember the story from the book of Ezra, chapters 1 to 6. So our hopes are high, and the future seems very bright, but it's not, actually. At least from Haggai's point of view. The book consists of four sections that summarize Haggai's message given to the people of Jerusalem over the course of four months. He opens by accusing the people of misplaced priorities. And so yes, they have come back to Jerusalem, but they're spending all of their time and resources rebuilding their own fancy houses, while the temple still lay in ruins from its destruction from 70 years ago. So Haggai asks, are your own houses really more important than your allegiance to God? This neglect, Haggai says, is tantamount to the covenant rebellion of their ancestors, which is why the land is still unproductive, why they've been struck with famine and drought. And here Haggai's quoting from the list of covenant curses in the book of Deuteronomy. And so Haggai's challenging words, they're followed by a story of the people's response. Remember also the story in Ezra chapter 5. We're told that Zerubbabel, Joshua, the remnant of the people, were provoked by Haggai's message, and they were motivated. They started rebuilding the temple. So in the next section, Haggai follows up one month later, and he addresses some problems of shattered expectations among the people. So the temple that they're rebuilding is really pretty unimpressive. It's nothing compared to the glory of the temple Solomon built here some 500 years earlier. And so morale was really low for finishing the project. And so Haggai reminds the people of the great prophetic promises of the future kingdom of God and about this temple. He draws from the earlier prophets, especially Isaiah and Micah, about the new Jerusalem and that it would be the place from which God would redeem the whole world and where all nations would come and participate in God's kingdom, resulting in an era of peace. And so the temple, it plays a key role in God's plans for the future. And Haggai calls on the people to work in hope, despite the disappointing circumstances. In the third section, Haggai follows up two months later with a call to covenant faithfulness. And he engages some priests in a conversation about ritual purity. Remember all the key ideas from the book of Leviticus. So he says, if someone goes and touches a dead body and becomes ritually impure or marked by death, and then they go and touch some food, is that food impure too? And the priests, knowing the book of Leviticus, say, yes, it's impure. And then Haggai turns this into a parable. He says, this is how it is with the people of Israel and what they're putting <coughs> their hands to in rebuilding the temple. If the current generation doesn't humble themselves, if they don't turn from injustice and apathy, then Haggai says whatever they build with their hands, including this new temple, will be impure too. Haggai's challenge is that it's only by true repentance and covenant faithfulness that their building efforts will result in God bringing his kingdom and blessing. And so in a sense, Israel's future lay in their hands, God's waiting for his people to be faithful. 
And so the choice that Haggai's laying before the exiled generation is very similar to the challenge Moses gave the wilderness generation before entering the land. Their obedience will lead to blessing and success, while faithlessness will lead to ruin. The book concludes with Haggai's summary of the future hope of God's kingdom. He's going to make the new Jerusalem the center of his glorious international kingdom. And from there, he will confront and defeat evil among the nations. He reminds people of the defeat of Pharaoh's army in the Exodus story. God will fulfill here his promise to David and establish the king from his line. And in Haggai's day, that was represented by Zerubbabel. And so the book ends with the choice of a bright future just hanging there. So the question is, will Haggai's generation be faithful to God? Will they experience the fulfillment of all these promises? And Zerubbabel, will he be faithful? Will he turn out to be the Messianic king? And you have to just keep reading into the final two books of the prophet, Zechariah and Malachi, to find out. But you can see how this little book contains a great challenge to every generation of God's people. That our choices really matter. And that the faithfulness and obedience of God's people is part of how God has chosen to work out his purposes in the world. And so this surprising truth should motivate humility and action in God's people as they look forward to God's coming kingdom. And that is the message of the book of Haggai. All right, there you go. <laughs> There's a lot in there, obviously, um, when you think about uh, um, the history, but um, uh, just a real short, it's only a couple chapters, and yet it's really addressing, uh, even us today, how do we respond to God's blessings, how do we respond to His grace and mercy, uh, are we joyful in our obedience, uh, I, the word came up in your study, or, or do we kind of do the things that we do under compulsion? Do we feel like we're, uh, we, we've got to serve Jesus? Or what's, what's the motivation behind how we, how we live and go about our life in the church? Uh, so here, um, now I'm going to back up to this first chapter that we looked at today. So Haggai, um, who is he? Well, we don't know much about him. Uh, his name uh, means uh, festal or festival. We're thinking about a great big celebration. Uh, um, and there's a connection... I don't remember the verse, but there's a connection here to this festal celebration and to the glory of God, uh, the glory of God. In fact, um, he writes, Haggai himself writes, uh, this is the Lord speaking, I will shake all nations and what is uh, desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Uh, this desire of nations. Have you heard that expression before? Uh, desire of nations. Do you know why it's familiar to you? There's a hymn. Yes. Don't say anything, Carol. You're our organist here. You can't speak. Uh, what's the hymn that says desire of nations that we're familiar with? Come? You got it. Yeah, you're right. Right. It's, it's a, oh, come desire of nations, come. And what's that from? Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Oh, so far we've forgotten Advent and Christmas. It's been so long ago. But it's one of those uh, antiphons, the seven antiphons, a number of antiphons in that hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, Desire of Nations. Uh, this is uh, historically, you look at the Old Testament, is a reference to the coming uh, Messiah, the coming Savior. So even in Haggai, you'll see just traces of his glimpses uh, of his prof prophetic... Uh, promise uh, that the Savior of the nations will come, desire of nations. Of course, we know this to be Jesus. And here, uh, they kind of picked up on this in that last video we watched, but Haggai is talking in terms of the, the desire of nations will be the temple, will be the, uh, the source of all blessings. Not necessarily a particular a house or a, a structure, but Jesus himself will be the temple. In fact, Jesus says that, uh, you remember in the gospel, uh, where he tells the uh, religious leaders, they give us a sign, and he says, well, I'll destroy this temple and build it again in three days. And what's their response? Yeah. Yeah. It's been 60 years for this temple, starting back with this building here after they came back from exile and finishing through King Herod. And it took all these years, and you're going to destroy it in three days. And, um, and then John, who records this, the Gospel of John, uh, the disciple says, 
they didn't realize, the disciples didn't understand this until after his resurrection that Jesus is talking about what? The body. Yeah, so he's talking about uh, the temple, of course, will be him. Uh, his resurrection uh, from the grave will be the, the, the place, that his death, his resurrection, that gospel message uh, will be the place where blessing will be given. And then he will, of course, uh, also, uh, as Jesus promised, there will be a new Jerusalem, uh, a heavenly home. Uh, and then also a new heavens and a new earth on the last day. So these are kind of elements that are like a tiny thread woven through Haggai, and then into Zechariah, and then into Malachi. Uh, so was that, uh, Haggai prophesied in the year uh, 520, which is 18 years after the Israelites had returned from exile. Uh, so they'd kind of come back, some of them came back, started rebuilding things, but Haggai didn't uh, uh, <coughs> prophesy until 18 years later. Uh, there's some, uh, we don't know for sure anything more about him, uh, but it, it, some have kind of read into one of these passages I'll post here that he might have been a, one of the captives that was taken into, uh, one of the Israelites who was taken into captivity under Nebuchadnezzar uh, in 586. So if that's the case, uh, uh, and he comes back, he's probably in his, he's young, he's probably about 70 or so. Uh, <laughs> careful how you say that, okay. Um, if that's the case also, then he had seen the temple of Solomon. Uh, if, he, if this is true that he was uh, in Israelite before being uh, taken into captivity, he had stood at the temple and probably worshipped and offered sacrifices in this temple of Solomon. Uh, and we kind of think, wonder if that's the case, because he says here in chapter 2, verse 3, I know that's next week, but he says, Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? So when he's describing this new temple that they've worked on, he's basically saying, Who, who, who saw the old one? And maybe he's talking about himself. Who saw the glory of Solomon's temple? How does it compare? Uh, uh, he proclaimed four messages from the Lord, uh, four sermons, in a, in a short amount of time. Some of the other prophets, years and decades as prophets. But not Haggai. His, his ministry is relatively short. Uh, starting on, this is actually very, very uh, uncommon. There's specifics given as to when he started and when he finished. Uh, these four messages, August uh, 29th and uh, December 18th, because uh, it does describe in the year of, in the second year of Dar Darius's reign on such and such month, uh, this, is, this is how it is. Um, so the foundation of the new temple was finished in two years by Zerubbabel, everybody say that word together, Zerubbabel, that's a fun word, um, and Joshua the high priest. So for two years, they had been working before Haggai gets on the scene here. Uh, they've been working to rebuild, and all of a sudden just stop. We've got a foundation. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any building projects around Evansville, but there's a lot of building projects. I'm not talking about the roads, okay? Uh, <laughs> you've, you've seen a house that kind of gets the foundation built, and all of a sudden it just sits there. And you wonder what happened. Well, they didn't get the, the money, the financing. They didn't get the, the building uh, materials or whatever, but it just kind of sits there for... Uh, so they finished this, uh, but nothing, but the foundation, but nothing else. So uh, what was the problem? Why, why did they get the foundation done and all of a sudden just do nothing else? Well, there's a couple things. First of all, there were Samaritan troublemakers uh, that came onto the scene. Um, and let me, I'm going to explain that a little bit more to you. Um, Cyrus was the one who said, go home, rebuild the temple, rebuild the, the walls, rebuild the city. Cyrus, uh, and then um, as this is going on, Cyrus dies. And so Samaritans come along, and these Samaritan leaders come along and say, I mean, how do we know that Cyrus really said that? They start questioning that decree. So then Darius, who's his successor, uh, King Darius, uh, has to do some research, and sure enough, it's written down. Cyrus said, do this. And Darius says, do it. Okay? <laughs> this is what was prescribed, so do it. Uh, so it's King Darius, I should say, uh, who renews these efforts. And this is from Josephus, a uh, Jewish uh, historian. Um, he says, moreover, Darius made the Samaritans and neighboring nations return the villages they had taken from the Jews and contribute to the building of the temple. Uh, the Samaritans were angry and protested to the Persians, warning that the temple looked more like a fortress. Okay, this is after they started building again. So they were concerned that 
uh, this, they're building a war house, not a temple. That's what they were trying to tell everybody. Uh, there's actually, I uh, could have gone a little bit further than Josephus, Darius actually says, if you don't help, I'm going to crucify you. That's pretty much his words. <laughs> so, Samaritans were forced uh, to help uh, build this uh, temple. Remember the scene where they come up to, uh, it, I'm sorry, I don't remember that yet. Um, so here's the Samaritans, just a little bit of background on that. If you can see that map, I know it's a little bit odd, but um, Samaritans are up north. But who are these people? <clears throat> well, they're the remnant of the northern kingdom. When Israel, um, when Assyria came in to, from the north and leveled Israel, which is in the year 700 and... 29, I believe, um, they carted some of the Israelites off uh, into exile. Some of them were allowed to stay, and then a lot of Assyrians flooded in uh, to this new conquered area. So the, the Samaritans were made up of the northern kingdom tribes, um, the remnant, especially the Ephraim and Manasseh tribes. Uh, the Samaritans only believed in the first five books of of, of of the Bible, the, the Torah um, or the Pentateuch, uh, they didn't. They did not accept the prophets. By this time, uh, when Haggai, Haggai comes along, they did not accept the prophets. They did not accept the Psalms and the, and all those other writings. It was just the five books, as you can understand, leads to some problems. They don't trust the prophets. You know who all these prophets were. Uh, they built their own temple in Mount Gerizim. You can see that up there by Shechem. Shechem was their capital, and Mount Gerizim uh, is where they built their uh, temple. They they believed it was on Mount Gerizim where Abraham uh, was uh, called to sacrifice Isaac. Now the southern kingdom, Judah, thought it was another mountain, different mountain. But the Samaritans up north said, nope, Mount Gerizim, so they start building a uh, temple there. By the way, since you are New Testament people, you like the New Testament more than the Old Testament. Can you think of an occasion where Mount Gerizim becomes an arguing point between a Samaritan and a Jew? You do. You just didn't know it. It's not the woman. Not the Are you asking or tell? Asking. No, you tell me. Because mm -hmm. you got the right answer. Yeah. Who is it? It's the woman at the well. Yeah, like Cindy. Yeah, it's the, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman who goes to draw water from the well at noon, and Jesus is there, hey, give me something to drink. And they have this little discussion, and she says what? Well, you Jews worship in Jerusalem. We worship in Mount Gerizim. You know, she brings up that whole discussion. Because that's a big, big issue between uh, Jews and, and Samaritans. And Jesus doesn't bite on that, uh, that argument. Uh, he says, from now on, you'll be worshiping in spirit and truth. It doesn't matter where you worship. You'll be worshiping in spirit and truth. Uh, and there's an intermarried... They intermarried Assyrians. So those... Uh, Israelites that stayed up north, um, kind of be, in the Samaritan area, they married Israelites, or not Israelites, Assyrians, and other foreign ladies. Uh, and not only did that, but started adopting the Assyrian idolatry, or their gods, started worshiping uh, those gods. Um, uh, this is actually in Ezra. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin, remember Judah and Benjamin are a southern kingdom, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, Let us help you build, because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Asherah, wherever at, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the family of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. What's the problem? Why would they just take this outside help? They didn't trust him. They didn't trust him. Were their motives clear? I mean, they are up from Samaria. They're Samaritans. Uh, and they come down. They're actually, uh, Ezra says, they're enemies. Why would we let our enemies, those who only follow the Torah, those who who, uh, who have intermarried, you know, this by this time, there's a big wedge between uh, the Samaritans and the Jews. And so Zerubbabel uh, says, no, we got this. Because <laughs> we're not sure we can trust you. Uh, on this. So this is a little bit more history. It maybe helps a little bit more when we get into the New Testament and you start to see the Jewish people in the South 
uh, Galilee's up in the north, and to get from Jerusalem up to Galilee, you got to go through Samaria. And that's why a lot of times they said, mm, we'll go the longer route, we'll walk on the other side of the Jordan River in the hot desert area to get to Galilee. We don't want to go through Samaria. There's a big... Um, I mean, this is worse than West Side, East Side. <laughs> this is, they just don't like each other at all. Um, so when Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, now you understand why that was such a, you know, such an eye opener for them. All right. So that's the, that that's one reason why they they stopped building because these Samaritan troublemakers have come in and caused all kinds of confusion. Uh, did, did Cyrus really say do this? Do you really want to build it there or whatever? They caused all, all these problems. There was another reason. This is what you looked at today in your, in your homework. They had bad priorities. That was probably the main reason. Misplaced bad priorities. Uh, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time is not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. They're stalling. They're procrastinating. Uh, the people say, uh, not yet. Now, when Cyrus issued the decree, and it was, of course, through the Lord's word, issues his decree, there's no timetable here, but the expectation is get to it now. But the people go, hmm. Not, it's not time yet. There's a time for everything, right? It's not time to build the temple. Why do they think it's time to build the temple? They want to. And more pressing things going on, like take care of ourselves. God would understand, right? God understands we need to put a roof over our head and fill our bellies with uh, fresh produce from the fields. Uh, God understands that's a much more of an important priority than place to worship. So uh, Haggai uh, says, seriously, this is my translation, <laughs> seriously, you've wasted no time or expense building your own homes. You've spent all this time uh, working on your own fields, your own crops, your own homes and everything and done nothing uh, to build the Lord's house. What is wrong with you people? That's kind of how Haggai approaches it. Uh, so we would say this would be a first commandment problem, right? What is the first commandment? Checking you out here a little bit. You shall have no other gods. Um, you shall have no other gods. And we would say what? Uh, what does this mean? Uh, what does this mean? And you know the answer to that. We should... We almost lost that last part. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. It's always a, it's a tough commandment for all generations of God's people. Fear, love, and trust in God more than anything else. More than anything else. Of course, we know in our own hearts that's a struggle. Uh, there's a, a lot of other things that seem to be more important at times uh, than our our relationship with the Lord. And this is their problem. Oh. <laughs> That's just for emphasis. Um, God's not interested in our leftovers. See, that's what the, uh, the people at Haggai's time uh, were wanting to give God. Once we get done taking care of ourselves, if we didn't have any supplies or any time or any whatever left over, then we'll get to it. Then we'll get to building the temple. But not yet. Uh, and that's, that's a down-the-road project. Uh, so, but God's not interested in our leftovers. Wasn't interested in their leftovers. Not interested in our leftovers. What does God want? We call this what? First fruits. What's a first fruit? First one. Exactly. It is. It's the first and The first uh, when they would go on a harvest, whether it was uh, wheat or barley or grapes or olives, whatever harvest was going on, they would take the first fruits, the first cutting, the best cutting. And they would do what? Hoard it away for themselves? No, give it to God. If they were faithful, they would take it to the temple or wherever and offer it as a sacrifice. And notice how much faith it takes to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you take all the blood, you know, the first fruit, uh, and you and you give it to God, trusting what? That there's going to be more. That there's going to be enough for you to survive. And and uh, and if you don't do that, if you're saying, well, the first fruit, let's, let's just 
let's get through, let's, let's fill our coffers, let's build bigger barns, let's get everything taken care of, and then what we have, and then we'll go to the temple and offer that, see the difference in attitude there, and the difference in trust, and the difference in faith. Uh, so he doesn't want our leftovers, but our first fruits. Um, and uh, we, we say this quite a bit in our circles, and I'm not sure if it was an Old Testament or not, but uh, our first fruits of talents, treasures, and time. Uh, this is what God desires from us. This is first commandment stuff. We fear and love him above all things. And our joyful response to all that God has given to us is to offer him first of our time, first of our gifts and abilities, first of our treasures. Um, we could, I could spend another 12 minutes, 15 minutes, or even longer talking about a stewardship thing here. But I think we understand this. Um, now, tying it back to the, uh, what's going on in Haggai's day, uh, it just wasn't important for them uh, to build a temple. They just felt like that was not a top priority. What was more important is taking care of self. Uh, just one story. I had a, a pastor who was a, still is, a friend in, in, in Nebraska, and um, they were going through, their church was really struggling, their sanctuary was really struggling, it was old, and it was kind of falling apart. <clears throat> and of course, uh, he and his leaders, a uh, small congregation, but he and his leaders were, you know, we need to set some money aside, we've got to deal with this. This is going to, you know, the sink's going to collapse, and all this, or the sink, the ceiling's going to collapse, uh, and, they, and they kind of put together this plea to the congregation. And uh, he was telling me the story how uh, some of the, I think you know what I mean by this, the heavy hitters. You know what I mean by heavy hitters? Okay. A little bit more wealthy. Uh, uh, I, I, I kid you not, they said to the pastor and to the, to the group, uh, not yet. <laughs> was precisely, I was thinking as a reader, wait a minute, I remember that conversation with my buddy. Not yet. Uh, we need to save a whole bunch of money before we do that. It's going to take us a while. And uh, he, he told me this, and he didn't say it in confidence, so I'm not, you know. But he, he told me it was really hard for him as a pastor because as the services, which on Sunday morning, he would see all these uh, $150,000 trucks, farm trucks, and all these different new cars pulled in the parking lot. And he was trying not to be judgmental. But it's hard, isn't it? When you, when you have a group come tell you, we, we can't fix the church, we don't have the money yet, and yet they are showing. Does everybody understand that illustration? When he told me that, it kind of stuck in my brain. And, uh, and I thought about here at St. Paul's, not because you guys are that way, not at all. Uh, but I was thinking in terms of our own um, time. I've been here for 20 years, so uh, all the different projects we've had. And I know a lot of you remember these. I wrote some of them down. Think about all the build, just the building projects we've had since 2001. I haven't been here that long, but almost. Can you just name some? Well, we are right now. <laughs> Where we are right now, yeah. This was built, uh, the gym was built in 88, and this was built around the same time. 2001, we built the, the uh, offices for the pastors and the church secretary in 2001. Had to remodel upstairs because we have a school coming over from Trinity, right? We had yeah. older kids upstairs, so we had to remodel up there. Um, and then we, in 2007, I believe, or 2008, we remodeled the sanctuary. Uh, we've painted it and it all blue. that stuff. What's that? It was blue. It was blue. Now it's not. It's a burgundy matching our hymnals, uh, which we don't use. Uh, but, uh, so we remodeled the sanctuary. Uh, the food pantry was meeting over here. Then it wasn't just us. It was the Lutheran Community Outreach Center was built uh, through LMAC, through don donations from all congregations. But we put a lot into that, too. Built that new building over there to house food pantry and a counseling service. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, we tore down property, uh, things like that. We, um, in 2000, um, let's see, we refurbished our pews just recently. Uh, what did I say? A new playground area. 2017, was it, Terry? Do you remember? Jim, do you remember? When did we, when did we do the, big do the, the yeah, elevator big project? 14, 14, 15, 14. Yeah. So we did that. That was a million dollars or so. And then we just redid the uh, bottom uh, uh, classrooms. And I don't bring it, there's a lot more we did. Uh, but I only bring that up, not so that we can kind of pat ourselves on the back and look how faithful we are. Uh, but I bring it up so we can pat ourselves on the back and say how faithful we are. <laughs> In my experience as a pastor here at, at this congregation, 
um, we've done pretty well recognizing that our facilities are important. And it's not because we want to show up the neighborhood or anything like that, but our facilities are important because of what takes place here. God uh, gathers here with us in his word and his sacrament of worship. He's, uh, of course, here in our school uh, and when we gather around his word. Uh, so we've always kind of had a uh, um, pretty, pretty good understanding. Now, I'm not saying it's been easy. How many times have we had to plead? <laughs> you know, we, we still need this amount of money. We still need this amount of money. Uh, but one of the things I've appreciated about St. Paul's, and I know I've gone off track here, is that in all the times that we've done this that I know of, we never once uh, asked or put a list out of all the, all the donations, the amounts that people have donated. Have you seen that like at a hospital? or uh, I, I get that. But when it comes to the church, I think this came up in your, um, in your homework. Um, we never say, uh, so-and-so family gave $100,000 to this project. Why would we not do that? It doesn't Does matter. What's that? They don't want to be proud. Really. Wanted to get proud about it. Most people don't give with the idea of looking up good idea. We don't want our glory. Yeah, we don't want the glory. We just for the sake of for the sake of the church. Uh, and uh, but <laughs> I was talking to Zona about that. She was looking through some old records. I don't know that any of you were around at that time. Yes. Yeah, you, you remember yeah. they used to put in the annual report how much each family gave to the church. I'm so glad that that fell away because I don't understand. I guess there's probably a motivation behind there, but wouldn't that be more of a compulsion type giving? When I look at my list, of, oh boy, I can't compare with the uh, the the, the Stuart bonds. You know, <laughs> comparing yourself. Would it be more of a compulsion, a little bit, maybe a little bit more guilt giving? Um, shame people, maybe. I don't know if that's why they. I, I I trust the the forefathers of our church. They weren't doing to shame people, but I don't know. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I, I kind of digressed, but uh, if you take that and you apply it to Haggai's day, you have a group of people that says, we don't need to worry about this stuff of God. Uh, we've got to take care of ourselves. And we're so blessed here at St. Paul's that I've never seen that attitude. Um, uh, Haggai says, uh, give careful thought to your ways. He says it several times in this short book. Give careful thought to your ways. What do you think it means by that? What's your motivation? Where's your heart? Your attitude. What's your attitude? What are you? Why are you doing this? Why are you not doing this? Uh, you know, give careful thought. Is this still something that we should be resonating with us as well? Um, uh, they're misplaced. Our priorities reflect our faith and our heart. Uh, Jesus would say, uh, "Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also." Remember that parable, or not parable, but that teaching. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I would turn it away. I'm not, not changing Jesus' words, okay? But I think the reverse would be true as well, right? Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Right? Jesus is saying where your treasure is, you're going to focus on it. What's most important to you, then you're going to commit your life to it. Your heart's going to be committed. But I would flip it around too and say what you're most committed to, that's where you're going to pour your resources. But they had a problem with this. They had a heart problem. Uh, they were rich toward the things of this world, but poor in things toward God. We can see the application, of course, in our lives as well. Worship wasn't a priority. And I don't know if that's because when they were off in exile. Now, this is where the... This is way off track, too, but I think it's important for history. When they were off in exile, off in Persia or wherever they were, Babylon... Uh, they did worship. This is where the synagogue developed. The concept of a local congregation, place to gather, the synagogue developed while they were dispersed uh, in exile. Uh, and I don't know what those synagogues looked like. Maybe they were small little buildings or whatever. Uh, but for whatever, when they come back into the new promised land, this was, they should be rejoicing. They never thought they would see this new land. Or some of them weren't even born here. This was, in, this was the promised land. They're coming back, and yet worship was not at the top of their list. To us, that would be kind of go, that's, I don't understand that. But if worship wasn't a priority, therefore the temple wasn't important. If they came back to the promised land, we've got to give thanks to the Lord, we got to praise Him for taking care of our, our people while we were exiled. Now we've we got a gracious 
foreign king, Cyrus and Darius, who, who are very tolerant of religion, let us come back and do it. We should be giving. First thing we should be doing is building the temple, a place for us to gather and worship. But it wasn't important for them. And so God gets their attention, as he has to do with his people quite a bit. And how did he get their attention? There's a drought. There's a famine. All that hard work to, to build their homes, to build their land, to cultivate, to grow, to have wine, to have all that stuff. They come out and the fields are, it's, it's a drought. It's a famine. And this is... And so God can kind of do that sometimes today too, doesn't he? He uses different means, even natural things, to get our attention when we've strayed. It works. Uh, the, then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, I guess, uh, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. So here comes Haggai. This is, remember, 18 years after they've been back. Haggai finally comes and says, What are you doing building your own homes and stuff? This is why there's a famine. This is why there's all this punishment. Build the house of the Lord. And they go, Oh. Oh. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. On the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. In case you wanted some historical reference, this is when the building started. Uh, and it was all because God spoke his word through this prophet Haggai and basically said, that's all prophets say, repent. Repent. Stop doing your sin. Turn around and do what is right. God told you to build his temple, now do it. <laughs> Enjoy. Because of the blessings that will be given as you do this. All right. So give careful thought to your ways. Our priorities, of course, Jesus tells us. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek what first? Not the leftovers. Don't, we don't come and seek the kingdom of God, the things of God, including worship and a uh, place of worship and all that. We don't seek, that, seek those things when we have time or when it's convenient or when our bank accounts are full. Uh, he says, seek first the kingdom of God. Put God first, first commandment stuff. And guess what? He loves you. And he's going to provide for you. All the other things that you worry about, this is in that passage, don't worry about what you eat or what you will drink. All these other things that we might preoccupy our time with, if our motivation is seeking God's will and seeking to uh, continue to proclaim his, his word and uh, being gathered around that word, if our motivation is pure and true, uh, he's promised, and honestly, he does it even if we don't do it correctly, right? He still takes care of us, doesn't he? Even if we are falling down all the time, he still provides for our needs. Okay, so that's our priorities, and that's what Haggai is trying to get uh, this, uh, these people to see. I'm done. Any questions? All right, let's uh, pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, your tremendous blessings are showered upon us, and many times we don't even know how you are caring for us, but we trust and know that you are. Uh, Lord, forgive us for those times we've taken uh, you for granted, our relationship with you for granted, and have been too immersed in the things of this world and too sidetracked uh, by our own uh, desires and, and needs. We know that you have promised that you will give us all that we need uh, to support this body and life. You give us uh, uh, jobs and incomes and careers. Uh, you put food on our, our tables. Uh, you give us places to live. You provide all of this uh, through the natural good work of others. And so help us to trust in that and be, be about um, your kingdom, uh, putting your kingdom first. The kingdom uh, that you have said to us comes to us when you gather with us in your word and the blessed sacraments as we are strengthened in our faith and worship in a beautiful place that you've given to us. Uh, that we can be gathered together around that word with our brothers and sisters in Christ and then also go out into the world uh, with that good news. Help our congregation to always be about uh, serving you, seeking your kingdom first, and just knowing that you will always uh, take care of us. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.